Hey, welcome back and thanks for watching. And thanks for subscribing, by the way. We're only a few subscribers away from that magic number 300 and we're gonna have a great giveaway. So if you haven't already, click the subscribe button. Click the like button, leave a comment. Hey, you know what I mean? If you wanna get information about my new videos as they come out, ring that little bell icon down there and you'll get notifications. So, you know, having heroes can be tough, right? Because you lionize your heroes uh, for their past works, particularly artistic heroes, right? They created some of the works that uh, gave us the comics that we know today. Um, but when they put out new works, it doesn't always live up to that past glory. Uh, it can leave a bad taste in your mouth. And, you know, it reminds you of how great they were at one point and um, have, have they lost it? Has, ha have they jumped the shark, so to speak? You might guess that I'm talking about uh, Frank Miller's work in Superman Year One. Today we're going to review issue number two. So uh, strap in and let's take a look today on Comic Book News. Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about uh, Superman Year One, issue number two. It was written by Frank Miller, it was drawn by John Romita Jr. It's 64 pages and costs $7.99. Of course, it's in this giant uh, oversized kind of format. It's not your typical floppy comic, right? It's 64 pages, no ads, uh, glossy paper uh, in this giant format that won't fit into any of your comic bags or boxes or any of the ways that you store comics. But hey, maybe that's okay. Maybe you can put this one on a bookshelf. Um, before we jump into the Million Dollar Comics Cam, I want to talk a little bit about Frank Miller, right? Frank Miller came on the scene in the late 70s and uh, started doing some work uh, for indie comics. He got into the business by going and um, uh, talking and meeting his heroes. He met Neil Adams, who looked at his work and just tore it apart. He said, man, this stuff is awful, but he saw something there. He saw some talent. He saw the raw kernel of talent. And he, he got him into the industry. Um, from there, he moved on to uh, Marvel Comics. He did fill-in work on stuff like Spectacular Spider-Man and did some covers here and there. Obviously, he was talented. His like his draftsmanship and his drawing skills um, were at a high enough level to be considered you know professional. And certainly, if he's drawing covers, um, the guy was good. But he hadn't really broken out yet. So while working on Spectacular Spider-Man, uh, he was given a story with uh, Daredevil in it. It started him thinking about the potential of a blind character in a visual medium. At least that's what he says, right? And uh, of course, we know what happened from there. He went on to work for Dare, uh, work on Daredevil. Uh, Denny O'Neill took over as an editor. At that point, DD was one of the low-tier characters. It was published bi-monthly. Uh, and it, it was written by uh, Roger McKenzie at the time. And Miller took over uh, penciling, um, but sort of ripped, bumped heads a little bit with McKenzie and, and wanted to write the stories on his own. So Denny O'Neill said, all right, Miller, we're giving you a chance. He took over Daredevil and it took off like a rocket immediately. Sales went way up. They immediately, after just three issues, they switched it to monthly because it was selling that great. The buzz was out on the street about this Miller kid, right? He wrote, he took a Daredevil, a third tier Marvel character and elevated it to the book that everybody was talking about and everybody was reading. Hopefully you've read some of that stuff, right? His work on Daredevil was awesome. It was just a cut above everything else going on in uh, superhero comics at that time, especially at Marvel. Um, took it in sort of a more of a crime noir direction that was always sort of Miller's thing. He loved Raymond Chandler and the old hard-boiled uh, crime novels and movies and, and that kind of stuff. And he brought that sensibility to Daredevil just to terrific effect. It was awesome. After Daredevil, he went on to DC. One of his, uh, er, 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 he was viewed as the hot creator, right? So he was given some leeway and he had one of the first creator-owned titles, a book called Ronin. Where, you know, he took all his love of Japanese comics, which really had not broken into mainstream American consciousness at that time, and um, sort of wrote a story that, uh, that, that synthesized a lot of that stuff and brought some storytelling techniques that had not been seen in Western comics. Um, it might have been a little bit ahead of its time. I mean, it's, it was popular. It sold pretty well. 
Um, but it was never considered like the breakout incredible uh, hit that I'm sure he and DC hoped that it would be. So uh, after working on Ronin, though, did some other work uh, on Batman. And eventually, uh, by 1986, he did The Dark Knight Returns. And if you don't know what that is and why that's important to comics and what that did, not just for DC Comics and superheroes, but the entire um, industry and medium of comics, then I suggest you go read it. Um, and uh, if you're one of those youngsters, try and put it in context because no Batman comic, every Batman comic since has been somehow tapping into something that came out of that that book and none since have captured it and nothing before was even close. Not to say that the stuff that came before and after weren't great in their own way, but you know he really marked a, a sea change in, in Batman. So anyway, working at DC, uh, they were rumored to be putting in uh, sort of a, a rating system, an age rating system. And no, Miller is notoriously against censorship of any kind. So he jumped ship in the early 90s and went to Dark Horse to produce uh, purely creator-owned books. And that's where his creativity was really free to explode. Like, away from corporate-owned characters and pre-established mythos, he was able to create Sin City, right? Sin City and Marv first appeared in Dark Horse Presents... Um, as just one of the chapters in that anthology. And, and as a kid, I was way into it. Everybody who was into Miller saw this stuff, saw it looked like nothing he had ever done before or had ever been done before in comics and really wanted a piece of it. And the, the rest is history. Sin, Sil Sin City, he worked the next 10 years on various Sin City books. In my opinion, it's during this period when his work started to get more heavily adapted into movies and, and, um, and, and other media that his work started to suffer a little bit. At least the writing did. D did his reputation go to his head? Maybe. Um, but things started to change. The writing took a shift. I started to like it a little less. Maybe it was me maturing as a reader and rather than him changing. Maybe he had always sort of written in this sort of... Um, it's really tough to describe, but it's a world where every female is... is, is like a whore and an assassin and and uh even the the regular people like marv is supposed to be a regular guy and all the characters in city city they really were superhuman in their abilities um it just got a little weird you know during before uh sin city though of course he did stuff like hard boiled like i talked about he wrote a couple of robocop movies that got ripped apart and adapted in various different ways into crappy movies um but since, you know, and then it made a move back to D to Marvel and worked with John Romita Jr. on Daredevil, The Man Without Fear. It was sort of like an origin um, story for Matt Murdock. And I'll be honest, of all the Daredevil work that, that Miller's associated with, and there's a lot of it, this is the one I'm the least familiar with. I, I, I know I read it at some point, but it's kind of forgettable. And everything that I've looked into and read about it, I don't, I don't have a copy. I didn't have a copy to revisit kind of forgettable not anything special um and and unfortunately that's kind of how i feel about um superman year one so let's go to the million dollar comics cam and superman year one it's so big we had to expand the million dollar comic cam a little bit and and uh just to get this entire thing uh in the picture and we can't even barely do that so anyway in our last issue, we saw Clark Kent grow up in Smallville, and at the end, he answered the call to adventure and decided he was going to join. Uh, he was going to join the Navy, right? We don't know why he had a calling to the sea. Something about a call to the sea. Something about the call to adventure and the hero's journey is echoing very heavily in this book, right? Frank Miller was obviously thinking about the call to adventure uh, of the hero's journey. So the problem I have with this is, is, you know, we get to see all kinds of stuff of, of Clark and the Marines. It's always fun to see boot camp and training in the Marines, right? Um, except when you're Superman, it's not hard at all. It's far from hard. It's incredibly simple and easy. It doesn't tax you in the least. So while all of his uh, uh, cohort are like struggling in the Marines, Clark is just like, boom, he just takes care of everything and just... No problem. He's an he's an expert marksman. Um, 
and and he's quickly like noted for that the fact that he's just unflappable unbeatable he hits every target directly in the center you know everybody else is all over the place he just hits one hole every bullet goes through the same hole um so he's quickly tapped to become like a sniper um i guess nobody's also noticing that like the guy can do unlimited push-ups pull-ups like does not tire out probably doesn't sweat when he's running like someone is noticing right and that is his uh uh commanding officer uh jacob kurtzberg right and if you don't know the name J- jacob kurtzberg uh, he that that's Jack Kirby's real name, so I feel like there's a little bit here of um, maybe self-identification of Miller as Superman as being seen with tons of potential by um, a superior who uh, is also very accomplished. I I don't know. Maybe that's just a little throwaway um, that he's Jacob Kurtzberg, but you know, what are you gonna do? Um, so basically we get they're in basic training and and nothing stops clark he goes out he's just the perfect gentleman he gets into bar fights of course nobody can touch him or do anything to him my problem here is there's very little drama right this is the problem with writing superman and and we'll touch on this in in a little bit about why i think so many writers uh, and people have struggled with superman so Clark's base is stationed on the Pacific Ocean, and at night he hears this calling, this siren call, literally, like from the sea. And um, he decides to go check it out. And who do we get out there but a race of mermaids, like from Atlantis? And of course, uh, one of them is named Lori. They're telepathic, and one is named Lori Lamaris. Now, if you don't know your Silver Age Superman, Lori Lamaris was a mermaid that uh, young Clark Kent slash Superboy on the cusp of being Superman uh, dated. And and um, when she was in college, she was in a wheelchair and she had like a blanket over her fish legs. And uh, eventually it's revealed she's a mermaid, telepathic, and knows he's Superman. But because they come from such different worlds, they can never be together. Um, cute story. Lamaris has been brought back in other stories, you know, pre during and post crisis and infinite crises and whatever so this is just um miller and 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 ramita's take on this classic character and they're far more like less uh cute looking and way more like sort of like biological like fishy type people and we get to see atlantis has been crashed into by a nuclear sub and clark is a hero of course so he's gonna help them and, uh, of course, uh, the telepathic mermaid falls in love. And, uh, and there's a, a, a love story will unfold, right? We get to see Clark after, after saving um, Atlantis is, is brought uh, back for more basic training where he's completely unbeatable. There's no stakes to this. You know, you know that nothing is going to hurt Clark. And it's really, like, uh, uh, kind of boring. So uh, Clark is, they're, they're tapped to go on a mission because apparently there's no real team available. So they're going to take these trainees on a real terrorist fighting mission. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but whatever, it's a comic book. Um, and that's a terrible excuse, but what, what are you going to do? So they're going in and they're, they're, they're taking out the terrorists and they're killing people, except for Clark, right? Clark never kills anybody in this. You know, and as Superman, he probably doesn't need to. He can just, you know, with knock people out and do whatever and in fact he smothers a grenade with his hands and saves everybody uh including the terrorist who was holding the grenade right so like clark's a do-gooder okay it's superman that's his thing he doesn't kill he's raised that way that's fine even though you're in the navy and you're being trained to kill and none of that makes any sense um so unfortunately because of the bar fight that got started that wasn't his fault and because of these other shenanigans um, he's just deemed not Navy material, right? They go, look, man, and this rings true to me. Like, we don't care how good a shot you are. We don't care that you can do unlimited push-ups. You've got to listen to orders, kid. If you don't do exactly what we say, the way we say it, it's not going to work. So they decide that, um, you know, he's a good enough guy and everything else. They're not going to give him a dishonorable discharge. They give him an honorable discharge and he leaves. And he's fine with it. And he walks out, he leaves, and he walks out into the sea. 
Okay, back to the sea to be with Lori, uh, his fishy gal pal. And, you know, um, it's pretty much implied that they make love and they have sex um, here. I don't know how that works when you... I, I really don't know how that works when you don't have legs. I don't want to get too graphic here or anatomical, but what do they do? I know some fish, like fertilize the eggs outside i i don't even want to go there uh so this is when superman finally decides you know he's not clark kent anymore he's in this undersea kingdom he's breathing water he's not really breathing he's just like he doesn't need to breathe so he just lets the water go through his lungs and he decides to you know wear the superman suit that mommy made for him finally um and basically, the rest of the story is, is him sort of being tested, right? He's being tested by the guardians at the gateway of the threshold of manhood or whatever. Um, basically, it boils down to the fact that, uh, uh, that that the king of this city, Poseidon, right? The king of the ocean is the mother of Lori, um, but also wants to marry her. A lot of heavily, not implied, but just straight up... Uh, uh, um, put out there that he's going to uh have incest with his daughter and that's just sort of like the way of the sea right oh under the sea uh they get wacky down there now the rest of this is him sort of being tested right he's like look my daughter likes you frog legs he keeps calling him uh so uh i'm gonna we're gonna stop you so we're gonna send all my warriors after you no you can't nothing stops them uh we're gonna send a kraken after you right this giant beast and there's a humongous fight but basically you know we know he's superman no matter how big this thing is he's never really in any danger the stakes never seem that high this goes on for a while you know they have 64 pages here to fill and and a lot of this it feels a little padded out especially finally the sea monster the kraken throws up superman only for Poseidon to unveil, you know, his ultimate weapon is really a the a bigger kraken. It's the mother of the one that he just fought and pretty much defeated without any kind of risks or stakes or whatever. Ho oh, hum. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's a neat looking kraken, but I guess. But John Romita Jr. is not really known for his like pretty things. I think he's a fantastic comic book artist. And as far as storytelling is concerned, like he really knows what it means to tell a story in a way that his his it, it, what he does almost becomes invisible on the page. That's tough to do, you know. So not noticing flashy stuff from a comics artist sometimes is a sign of a really great artist, and that's what I think Ramita is. But I mean, compare him to John Ramita Sr., his father, right? Where the just the rendering is gorgeous, and every single picture and person and face is just immaculately rendered that's not what jr jr does right he 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 draws storytelling he stop, draws action and storytelling so it works for me in that sense the artwork i'm okay with but i'm not wowed by the fantastic giant creature that superman pretty much defeats with no problem so at the end of this he's defeated poseidon who whatever who claims yeah i'll be back He's going to stay with Lori, maybe. And he's like, I could live here my whole life. But of course, we know that's not going to happen. Next issue, we get to see finally, like, maybe some Superman action as we know it. Um, Metropolis, Lois Lane, Daily Planet. I think that's where we're going. At least I hope, because we've only got one issue left. This is a three-issue series, right? There's 64 pages. Um, but there's only one left to go to get Superman to manhood. So um, let's talk about this book. I didn't think it was the greatest. Not super excited by it. I mean, both of the creators are so accomplished that I have to say that it's solid storytelling. I mean, it's above average for sure. It, it, it reads well and uh, the action is understandable and lively, but that's about it. That's as close as I can get. That's as good as I go, right? Uh, it just is not that compelling. Um, the The... There's no stakes for Superman. This is, there's been no introduction of Kryptonite yet or anything. He pretty much has no weaknesses. And he's at full strength basically since he, you know, uh, was a kid. This is one of my problems with Superman. I felt 
very few people have been able to reboot Superman in a way that sticks. The one that comes to mind who did it was, of course, John Byrne in the post-crisis Superman. And I think a lot of people, especially people my age, will look back to that book and go, man, that was good. And why was it good? Because the Superman before that, the Silver Age Superman, was so overpowered and so had such a convoluted, crazy twist around every corner from years and years of storytelling that John Byrne was able to simplify it, pare it down, take the things that work, excise the things that did not work, and most importantly, to depower Superman. They brought Superman's power. He's still one of the most powerful super heroes in the DC universe, but he was decidedly less powerful. No more. He wasn't spinning around the earth and making time go backwards. He's not moving planets now. He's just incredibly powerful. I think that was a key. We started seeing things like his costume, which used to be indestructible crypto cloth. Well, now it's more like an aura or a force field, and so his cape could get ripped or his costume could get ripped. And we just got to see Superman looking a little bit more beat up and haggard, not always just perfect. That really helped. I think a, a modern day approach to Superman needs to take that approach again. And I think it really fits in with the origin story too, because if you think about it, having a Superman that's, you know, comes to earth as a baby, that's as powerful, that's super powerful, that can lift up cars and throw things, doesn't make a ton of sense. If you've read Rick Veitch's Bat, Brat Pack, you'd know a more horrific result of that kind of scenario. But Either way, like, how could you control a baby? How could you teach a child about the consequences of their actions if there were no consequences to their actions, right? Because they could not be hurt. I've always felt it make a lot more sense if sort of Superman Clark's powers grew gradually so that when he was a baby, he was basically like a baby. Maybe a little stronger than a human baby. Maybe a lot stronger, but not superhuman. Not as not as strong as Ma or Pa Kent even, right? As a baby, because... They would raise him. They would gain the love and trust and respect. And then as he would grow, he would power up. I, I like to think of something like maybe his power grows on sort of an exponential level. So like maybe it doubles every year, his strength. So, you know, he's he was very powerful as a kid. And he's lifting 500 pounds, 600 pounds, you know, 1,200 pounds, 2,400 pounds, and doubles and doubles. And if you know how that kind of curve works, pretty soon he gets to Superman levels that are just so far off the charts and so crazy that it's more like the latter-day Superman. And I think that gives you a growth path, that gives you a leveling up, that gives you some stakes and consequences beyond just um, kryptonite, right? Um, that's the other thing, is is kryptonite is, is cool. Like, it's a great uh, secret weapon. Superman's uh, weaknesses also include magic, but I've always thought the Superman's real kryptonite is is his friendship and the people that he knows. So people know he's associated with Lois Lane or Jimmy Olsen or the Daily Planet, and so those things can be used against him by somebody smart enough. The best Superman villain is not somebody that has super crazy superpowers like Doomsday. They're strong enough to blast Superman into nothing. The best one are the brilliant ones, the Lex Luthors, uh, the the, um, the 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 schemers who can you know, use Superman's love and humanity against him. That's his biggest weakness, right? It's part of what I like about the current Bendis run is that uh, the, the character Leone, who leads the sort of mob in, in Superman, is um, uh, it's really more about just like a strategy. You can strategically, you can um, defeat, or if not defeat, you can avoid Superman and put Superman in check, if you will. Anyway, I've rambled a little bit, and maybe that's because... This Superman, Superman Year One, not super interesting to me. They've got a chance to pull it out. I'm going to read and review issue number three when it comes out. And that could be a great issue. If he can take it and bring it full circle and give us something really awesome and exciting, give us some stakes. I have a feeling maybe Kryptonite will come into play. Maybe Lex Luthor will come into play, certainly. And that um, maybe we'll get to see something a little bit more exciting. So um, until then, thank you for watching these videos. Thank you for liking, commenting, and uh, doing all the things that you do that support this channel. I couldn't do it without you. We're almost to 300 subscribers. I can't wait to get there. And uh, hey, thanks for watching.